the deal was there. But, but you, didn't uh, the you didn't look in the right place? Oh, okay, I mean, well, that's all right. We're even because I gave Mila a bad song. I didn't even talk, I didn't even talk to the <laughs> piano player before I led us all in worship. That's a big fail right there. That's a big fail. So we're even. We're even now. Uh, but <laughs> but um, so I, yeah, I, I know. Well, I don't know. You have more faith. Kent said I'll learn. He has more faith in me than I do. I don't know that I'll learn. But uh, <laughs> Milo's got a little bit more realistic perspective over here. But uh, I don't know what you have from last week, but if you have anything uh, in preparation, you did say we did talk about Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, correct? And uh, do, do you guys have any... Uh, well, did you talk about... Tom, did you... Was anything discussed about what we'd be discussing tonight? Did you? Okay, all right. So it won't be much of a report time, but that's okay. Um, well, let me ask you, how many of you looked over Philippians chapter 1, verse 6? All right, some of you? Good. No reports required on that. Well, you did write it. Man. You <laughs> I lost my paper and I memorized the wrong verse. I love it. <laughs> what? That was good. No, Shirley, Shirley tried to tell me, you know, that Steve's dog came over and ate her paper. She was going on with a good story. And <laughs> I, be I, I, I believe you. I really do. I just, I, I know. Well, let, let me tell you, let me tell you what I think is coming. All right, I'll tell you what I think is coming. This is why some of this is cracking me up. What we're, we're talking about sin tonight, and we're going to talk about temptation next Wednesday night. I honestly believe what's going to happen is I think this church is going to get tested because when we talk about temptation, we're talking about a battle in the mind, and that's about as much of a spiritual struggle as you're going to get. We'll blame it on the physical, but that's a spiritual struggle of who our master is, who we're mastered by. I honestly believe there's going to be spiritual attack, and you say, whoa, hold on, we don't want to talk about that. Don't curse us. No, 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 stop. It's not about a curse. I'm talking about reality. The spiritual conflict is already going on, whether you acknowledge it or not. For the weapon, for the battle we fight, are, it's not of this world. It is of the higher powers, the spiritual conflict between good and evil. And it's not God versus Satan on an even plane. It is evil rebelling against its holy and perfect and majestic creator. So I think as we get more into this discipleship study, we're going to see some of that. We're going to struggle with some of the things we're talking about because that's just how it works. God will be there to strengthen us as we talk about it, but the enemy will test us to be like, you don't know what you're talking about. You're not a Christian. You're not saved. Why are you going to this discipleship study as if you could lead anybody else to grow? When you're such a failure, don't be surprised if that comes across your screen in the next couple weeks. Okay? Now, I do have handouts tonight. Who here does not have a handout yet? Okay. Uh, well, next week we're going to talk about temptation, but tonight we're going to talk about sin. And there is a difference. Is, tem is being tempted a sin? I'm not hearing many answers tonight. Is being tempted a sin? No, it's not. Is dwelling on that temptation... And acting on that temptation, is that a sin? What, what, did, what did Jesus say? He said, whosoever dwells on this, whosoever lusts in their heart. You what? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that's what, yeah. If, if you've dwelt on that sin, then you've sinned. So tonight we're just talking about the sin itself. So what do you do when you see that ugly action come out? You do so, you, you, whether it's the anger, whether it's the stealing, whatever happens. Right now, we're talking about what happens when you see that sin come out. And this is, again, in, in the life of a Christian. That's what's a little bit different about this series. All right, now turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 10. Because we don't know what to do with it as a church sometimes. I've, I've heard the discussion from this church and many other churches. I don't know what to do with so-and-so. They were in Sunday school. They, they were a good witness in, in their high school or their junior high. They, they did this and that. They were such a strong testimony. And now, now you'd never know. You'd never know they walked with Christ. They've, they're, they're, they're living 
with uh, a, a partner now. They're not even married. They're just shacking up with somebody. They're, they're, they're known as a liar, as a thief. You, you look at all this stuff and you're thinking, what do you do? What do you do with sin in the life of a Christian? And then you say, well, forget about talking about everybody else. Let's look at our own lives. So what about me? What about the mistakes I made today? What about the sins that I commit? I'm supposed to be a follower of Christ, redeemed, a chosen people, a people called to be holy. What do we do about sin in the life of a Christian? So we're not just talking about sin outside the world today. I'm, I'm specifically having us point some fingers at ourselves tonight and say, what about sin here at Center Christian Church? Let's open up in a word of prayer before we read our passage. Heavenly Father, we've lifted to you these prayers. We've started the service out praying to you as a family. And Lord, right now we lift up this topic to you, this, this word, sin, something so filthy, you turned your head when your one and only begotten Son was crucified on the cross. You turned away. We don't understand what all that means, Lord. We don't know all the ins and outs of that. But we know that sin is absolutely detestable in your sight. You don't wink at it. Heavenly Father, I ask for your wisdom as we look at this, that we accept the weight. We accept the weight that sin brings so we can give it to you and allow you to take it off our shoulders. If we don't know what we're handling, then we don't know what we're to give to you and what we're to accept. Heavenly Father, open our eyes to what is sin in this world tonight so that we can bear the standard of truth and holiness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I thought I heard some people trying to, you know, escape while I was praying and for this message, you know, oh, well, this is a good time to go. Uh, so, and I got some examples from the congregation about sin tonight. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I've got a bunch right here. You want a list? I'm, I'm sure I've got a list here somewhere of my sins. All right. Now, um, just to explain where we're going with this, again, we're going to talk about temptation next week. Tonight, we're just talking about sin. So if you'd please stand with me for the reading of God's Word there where we're at in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, and we're just reading verses 5 through 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Let's see what God's Word has to say after Christianity had been exploding for several decades. Here's what we get. And this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John chapter 1 now to verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie. We don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin... We're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. You may be seated. Now, we, we already prayed for the message here, so I'm going to go right on into this underlying question, and that is, you look at those last two verses, maybe that's a little confusing. Maybe that's a little confusing. Or are we the ones that have made it confusing? Kent, if I had Snickers bar for every right answer, you and Yvonne both would be taken all of the supply. You know, I, I liked um, at the look... Make my job easier. Is that what it is? I, Yvonne, Vaughn, perhaps. I'm. I don't know about you. You just you distract me, and when I get distracted, it's not pretty. Ross, while he was teaching up there at Lakota Journey, uh, he was teaching, working with mainly the older high school group. And as he would teach, and uh, you know, I won't spoil everything they'll share here, but as he teach, he uh, he would ask specific questions at the end of the lesson. And I thought these high schoolers are doing better than this church would do. They remembered some stuff that I'm thinking, man, 
They were zeroed in on some specific facts in Scripture, and so he would toss them candy, you know, and, and uh, it, 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 was, it was a good time. It was fun. But um, that's what I'm wanting this setting to be here for this discipleship course is this is about what you and I are going to say to people one-on-one. -on -one. This isn't about what I say from the pulpit, okay? This isn't about what you could say if you taught a Sunday school class. This is about what you and I need to work with other growing or new Christians. These are things we need to talk about. Do you remember that what was the very first thing? What was the number one thing that we need to start discipling people on? What was the first thing? Close, right before salvation. The authority of the word. The authority of the word. No candy bars for anybody here tonight. The authority of the word. Because before, and you're right, salvation, you think, well, that's what we got to go with, and that is what we're geared to do. But first things first, I've seen too many cases where salvation is presented outside the authority of Scripture, and it doesn't last and it doesn't stick. And you could probably show me some examples yourself where you've seen that. I know that sounded like a trick question, but we do need to remember that order. We've got to first explain the authority of God's word. And then absolutely, once they understand that authority of the word and it's absolute, because if they don't, nothing you say about salvation matters. Who's God and who's he to say that I'm a sinner and why do I need to be saved from my sins if there's no authority in scripture? Now, we've covered the authority of scripture. We move on to salvation and the assurance. You are saved. You are saved if you've called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a point in time you've repented of your sin. You've repented, turned completely around from where you're going and turned to him. And then Tom talked last week about what part of salvation, not just assurance. What was the element of salvation last week? Eternal security. That's right. I don't have any candy bars or there have been four of you that got candy bars right there. Eternal security. So what do you do with eternal security? in sin and this is where the conversation gets murky and this is where you get some people saying well are you once saved always saved well there's a lot of baggage with that term once saved always saved and the insinuation is you can do whatever you want you've got to get out of hell free card so just it's a free ticket to ride every ride you want to ride whether it's good or not there's no evidence for that in scripture that you're allowed to do that Romans chapter 6 turn there with me real quick Romans chapter 6, turn there and, and see, <laughs> see what the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, thinks about that. He wasn't very impressed. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Whenever he says, what shall we say then? He is in essence saying, what are you talking about? What shall we say then? What are you talking about? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? God forbid, or as it, as it would say in the King James, and it would also say, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live therein? So when we talk about sin in the life of a Christian, and we talk about eternal security, there's no conflict. There's no conflict because if the Holy Spirit truly resides in your heart and in my heart, there will not be a pattern of sin that we can't break away from. Again, the conversation gets a little murky. This is why we're talking about this. We've got to disciple people on these questions because they don't know or they arrive to the wrong conclusions or they Google the answer. And Lord only knows what they're coming up with on Google. You can find some good resources on the internet, but I'm talking about, you'd be surprised how many people just put these things on a search engine, hit go, and that's their source of information. That's why you and I need to have these relationships. We can point out computer resources and say, go to this website. This is a gospel-centered website. I know the person building this site. It's a good place to go. We can say, check out these books from the library. We can say and guide and direct, but you and I have to have that relationship. Otherwise, all it takes is one bad search on the internet, and they come up with bad information, and now they're solidified in it, and they don't want to hear what you and I have to say because we didn't take the time before to guide them in what was true and what was right, and so they don't want to hear us now, they found another source for information. Time is precious on this. Time is precious, and when we talk about sin, this is going to be the touchiest subject because we all have our own pet sins over here. Yeah, I can't believe they're doing this, and, you know, alcohol this, and drugs this, and sex that, but no, no, don't, don't touch, 
Don't touch my little secret sin over here. I've got all my justifications figured out. And if this sin ever comes to light, it's going to get exposed for, as sin. So I'm going to keep it hidden over here. Me and God kind of have an understanding. No, you don't. None of us have an understanding with God when it comes to sin. God, God knows what sin is. And he has no, no toleration for it. So let's go back to our 1 John passage we're looking at tonight. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. I'm going to open it up for some discussion here in just a minute. Verse 6. 1 John chapter 1, go down to verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet we still walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Again, stop right there. Now, maybe in your mind right now, before you hear the rest of verse 7, you're running to all those do not judge passages in your brain. Or someone you're discipling is immediately going to run and grab all these do not judge and God is loving passages and come running back and say, See, we're not here to talk about sin. We, uh, my God's a loving God. And I can say, Yes, mine is too. Mine is too, but do you understand what love is? When we talk about sin, we've got to make sure we define what love is. Because we just got told lovingly, if we're not walking in a pattern of truth and obedience to God, then we're liars. We're liars. We're saying we're saved, and we're telling people about what Christ has done in our lives, and we're singing these songs. They have no meaning to God if we are not covered by the blood of Christ. So, let's read verse 7. Verse 6 is kind of depressing. But if we walk in the light, as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen to that. We like that cleanses us from all sins. We're not so hot on the walk in the light part because that requires effort. Effort. You've all probably seen you know, the little cartoon to the effect of who wants change? And everybody's raising their hand. And what's the next question they ask that nobody raises their hand for? Who wants to change? Who wants to change? And then all the hands go down. But when Christ dwells in us, there's something that keeps our hand up in the air. When the Holy Spirit's working and breathing through us, then when we encounter sin, there's something that after we've encountered that sin and we've fallen, we're, we're muddy, we're messy, there's something, rather instead of rising up in defiance to God, there's something that causes us to rise up and hold our hand up and say, I need, I need help, I want to change. This is not who I want to be. That's not you and I. Don't give your, don't, please don't give yourself too much credit. Don't give me enough credit on that. This is Christ doing this. This is Christ saying, there's hope for tomorrow, strength for today and hope for tomorrow. That's one of my favorite line, single lines out of a hymn. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. So when we talk about sin, there's hope for the Christian. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. Turn there with me. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19. I want to see what you think of this. This will be where we start some questions and answers here. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19. This is coming at the end of a long passage where the author of Hebrews in this exhortation is describing where the Israelites failed. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19. And so we see that they, the children of Israel, and so we see that they were not able to enter the promised land because of unbelief. Now we know the rest of the story. This is just summarizing that story. So I'm, I'm going to open this up for you to answer some questions here. Why does this passage link disobedience with unbelief? 
Why is there a connection here? We, we saw that clearly, fairly clearly spelled out, uh, spe spelled out there in 1 John chapter 5, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Why do we see disobedience linked with unbelief? Go ahead, what do you got? right yeah she, she's saying if you don't have enough belief in God and his ways then there's not going to be the strength there when the trial comes and the weight comes and the burden comes there'll be no muscles there to be able to coordinate there'll be no skill for battle because we're not we have no belief that God is who he says he is and that he's a mighty God That's right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. So if we are overwhelmed, if we are overwhelmed with who God is, then when sin comes along, it looks like nothing. Nothing when we stand in the light of who God is. That's absolutely right. Any other thoughts? The connection between disobedience and unbelief. Well, we pretty much covered it. Was, is there any, any other insight that you have, the, the connection between disobedience and unbelief? All right, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Can sin destroy your joy? Does joy affect your health? So can sin still cause destruction, physical destruction in the life of a Christian? Okay. Can God still redeem that? Absolutely. That's the God I serve. He redeems. But even David, after he repented, his son still died son he had out of basically out of wedlock out of the Lord's design there were still punishments there was still pain and Jesus redeems to the fullest but we're given guidelines here and now for how to be obedient not just so our lives are more comfortable but so that God is glorified and one way he's glorified is when we find our joy in him and when we struggle with sin or we're hiding sin or we're not dealing with sin correctly that's going to gnaw at us and wear us down and tear us down. And we're going to keep justifying our own little pet sin whenever the pressure comes on. We're going to go, no, no, no. This is, I'll give, Lord, I surrender all. I surrender everything. But don't take this hidden sin from me. Leave me alone. And Christ's response is, anyone who follows me has to be willing to die completely to themselves, take up the death penalty of the cross, and follow me. Where do we follow Christ? We follow him in obedience. Obedience unto death, even the death of cross. So when we talk about sin, it'd be easy to take one route and talk about how the sin is forgiven and it's redeemed and praise the Lord. Yes, it is. Praise the Lord for the atoning work of Jesus Christ. We wouldn't be here without it. Covered under that blood, knowing that we are saved, knowing we have that eternal security through the person of Jesus Christ and nothing we could ever do, knowing that through faith and repentance, a genuine belief in Jesus Christ, we are covered by the blood. There is still, as we walk and talk here, there should be fruit. There should be fruit. And you and I, as brothers and sisters, are supposed to examine that fruit. I want to hear what thoughts you have on 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Turn there with me if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. You know, as we disciple people and mentor people and talk with people, which is what we should be doing, go and make disciples, this is what it comes down to. 
yeah, I've cut it up into neat little lessons, and I know it's more dynamic than that. I understand. I understand that. But I'm saying we're to talk about the Word of God. We're to talk about salvation. We're to talk about sin. We're to talk about temptation. We're to talk about these things because it's what we deal with. And if we're not equipped and trained to handle it as Christians, who in the world, who in the world is going to be able to confront sin? Christ will ultimately confront sin, but He wants us to be a part of that redeeming work now. We're not just saved to go hang out at the dining uh, banquet table at the end of time, whenever He calls us home. We're not just saved so that we can have a place in heaven. That's, n that's not the end of the story. We're saved to be His redemptive and saving work here on earth until He comes again. So if we don't talk about sin... We're not talking about the full, the full gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 through 10. Read, read along with me. I'm going to let you read this to yourselves. I'm not going to read it out loud. I've got a question I'm going to ask. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 through 10. Reread verse 5 to yourself, just verse 5 this time when you're done. In what ways do you I extend this question to myself, but I had to answer this stuff while I was coming up with it. <laughs> what ways do you blame your sin on someone else? It's their fault. They started this process. If they wouldn't have done this action to me, I wouldn't struggle with this sin. If they wouldn't have demonstrated this to me, I wouldn't struggle with this sin. If they wouldn't have treated me this way, I wouldn't have struggled with this sin. What do you think that that passage we just read? What is verse 5 telling us we're responsible to do ourselves? What is verse 5 telling us to do? Examine ourselves. Who, who are we allowed to blame in that text? The preacher. <laughs> the preacher. Let me give you a Snickers here, Kim. We're to examine ourselves so we, we don't get to blame anybody else. What about the parents and the way we were brought up? That's going to have an impact on some things, and I understand that. I'm not disrespecting the whole study behind that. And Scripture is clear. The parents have a responsibility to raise the children upright. I understand all that. But when it comes to the subject of sin, we can't blame our parents. <laughs> and the parents can't blame the kids. <laughs> I'm only laughing. I'm only laughing because of last night was a long night. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, commit some angry sins last night. You know, I had some ideas. I thought Daniel might enjoy a little night in the backyard, and Rebecca might want to sleep on the front porch, and David might want to sleep in the attic, but <clears throat> but when that anger wells up, I can't blame them. We went on a church road trip to South Dakota. There were some interesting traffic situations up there. Ross and I both had the opportunity to blame, I'm not saying there was anger, but there was some anger, <laughs> mainly with me. We could have easily said, well, if this guy wouldn't have, uh, well, if they would just, we had, the, we had every opportunity to blame, but we had to ultimately accept the responsibility to be examples of Christ to everybody in that van. And the same is for, for you and me here. We have to accept that responsibility for ourselves. And so when you get into mentoring and counseling somebody else, this is going to come up. I guarantee it. If you haven't, you've probably already experienced this, where somebody starts blaming, well, you know, I only struggle with this because of this, and if this person would stop making me so stressful, I could stop doing this. And you're going to hear the excuses. Do not buy them. Do not buy them. They're not for sale for us as Christians. Don't buy them. Don't buy them. I'm going to say it one more time just in case you forgot. Don't buy the excuses. 
I won't, I won't repeat the entire quote, but <coughs> excuses are like armpits. Everybody has them and they all stink. <laughs> You've probably figured out the rest of the quote by now. It's truth, folks. Come on. It's truth. We're to be testing ourselves, and when we mentor somebody and we disciple somebody in the area of sin, we say, stop, don't stop, don't start the blame game. You are accountable directly to God. When you stand in heaven, when I stand before the Lord's throne as a Christian, my parents aren't going to be in front of me, thank God. My kids aren't going to be in front of me. Nobody's going to be in front of me. I stand before the Lord, and I stand accountable for my actions. That's how it works when it comes to sin. We have nobody we can blame. We're going to finish with Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. Before we move on, was was there any any more thoughts on that? Any more thoughts with our accountability and responsibility with sin? No, you couldn't, but I understand where you're going with that. Say it again. You said if you you say if you feed on your own excuses, could you call that eating food offered to idols? I don't think that's that's applicable, but I understand where you're going with that. I would say that it is worshiping yourself, putting making yourself the God who decides what's right and wrong. So I would agree with you there that that is creating an idol. Uh, Actually, of all people, John was one who warned about that twice, specifically. Stay away from idols. Stay away from idols. Uh, And so when it comes to sin, we do have a tendency to make ourselves God and say, I agree with God on all this except these two areas. That's my sin. I want to cover it. And when we're discipling somebody, we've got to say, you leave it all open. You leave it all open to the Lord's examination. And that's hard to do. That's hard to do. But that is what we have to teach. That's what we have to disciple. All right, look with me in Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. And let the one who is taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. And and let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Who is the book of Galatians written to? The what in Ephesus? The church. Sometimes we read these epistles, these Pauline epistles, and we think, well, you know, these are, these are for uh, those who are lost. You know, the, No. Yes, all of God's word can be given to the lost if you understand it in the context of the gospel. But this is for us. Jesus knew the church would struggle with sin, and Paul had to address it several times. He would say, this person is sinning, and and you've not confronted him. This person is spreading lies about Jesus, and you've not kicked him out. And some people in the church are like, well, I thought you were, you know, Jesus loves me and everything, right? Jesus, (laughs) Jesus would be saying, yes, I love you. That's why I want the people who are distorting the gospel out of the church. And when we talk about sin, there's a word, a word that we don't like to wrap our minds around, and it's called accountability. We have to give an account. Not only to God, and here's where the rubber meets the road, and here's where we cringe. We're called to confess our sins before each other. Now, I've got, I've got some poor examples of that. My uh, father-in-law shared a story with me where he, they would be, for a while they were looking for a church, so they visited random churches. And he doesn't even remember the name of this church or the denomination, but it was somewhere in the backwoods of Tennessee there. Uh, 
and if I remember this correctly. And what he said happened was they're in the service, and they had the time of the service where he said, all right, this is the time where we will all confess our sins to each other. <laughs> John Paul, my father-in-law, is kind of sitting back there like, what is about to happen? And it got about as bad as he thought it could get. And apparently there was a uh, lady that stood up and started pointing out, just like the, the Mississippi Squirrel Song, started pointing out three or four people she had had affairs with in the church. For some reason, John Paul decided it was time to take his family and hit the road before bullets started flying. Now, I'm giving you an extreme example. Now, we're going to do that next Sunday, so if you get... No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't believe that's the setup precedence we see in Scripture, although I'm sure it's entertaining whenever that happens. Because our focus is to be on Jesus Christ when we gather for worship. What I am saying to you is simply this. We are accountable to each other. We are to give each other an account of our struggles and our victories through Jesus Christ. We are a, we're one of the most private civilizations on the face of the earth. And we struggle with a lot more hidden sins than other nations. There's other pagan nations, and they worship false gods, and, and they've got false religions, and absolutely, but they don't generally hide that. We struggle with hiding our sins, and those are some of the ones that do the most damage because then we just play church, and then we're just hypocrites. And trust me, across the nation, statistic-wise, it plagues the pulpits just as much as it plagues the pews on hypocrisy and hidden sins. And I appreciate this church. They, they have an air of accountability. We have the eldership structure. I, I answered to the elders, and, and the elders basically answered to the entire congregation. And we've got, a, I believe, a good biblical setup here for accountability of everybody in the church. Nobody's left out of the circle. I, I I like where we're going with that. But we don't talk much about sin in the life of a Christian. We talk about maybe running away from it. And there's some sins we're told to flee. But we're told we don't, we don't have to worry about creating a way of escape. God's already created one. And we're going to talk about that next week. Next week we're going to get more into temptation. Because that's the birthplace of these sins. That's the birthplace of sin. So if you're looking and somebody's got this terrible sin, they claim to be a Christian, and somebody says, hey, can you talk to my son, my daughter, my cousin, my father, my mother? Can you talk to them? They're, you know, they're just really having a hard time. And you walk in, you and I walk into a situation, and we see the sin, and we are tempted to say, that sin is wrong, and we should. But that shouldn't be the end of the conversation. It started somewhere else. It started in the heart, and that tells me something's wrong with the heart. And usually... What's wrong with the heart is a lack of belief that God is who he says he is, and he hates sin as much as he says he does, and he provides the power to overcome sin like he says he does. It goes back to the authority of Scripture. It goes back to the authority of Scripture. Any, any thoughts on any of that before we wind down and I clarify next week's assignments? Sin in the life of a, uh, of a Christian and how we should talk about it in discipleship uh, and mentoring others. Is there anything I've left out, any questions you had with that that we didn't really cover or anything I've covered you don't, you don't agree with or don't understand? What, any feedback right now? Yeah, that would be either be uh, Psalm 49 or Psalm 50. And uh, whenever it said, evil fleeth from good, and in that passage it's talking about God's power. God's power. There's nothing we could produce to make evil to flee. Uh, it, it only, uh, right now we're told in the New Testament specifically, uh, evil flees at the name of Jesus Christ. Specifically, there's an element, though, with the name of Jesus Christ. What is it? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Because the blood of Jesus Christ took away the sins of the world. So you're right. Evil will flee. They can't, they can't stand, can't stand the blood of Jesus Christ or that testimony of what happens with the blood of Jesus Christ. Any other insights? Any other questions you have? You know, the, the sheets I hand out are for your benefit throughout the week, and then 
uh, you know, as you bring them back, because I, I want to know as a church, th this is what we're supposed to be doing. We, we say it, save the lost disciple to save. This is what we say. We got it on our boards and all that good stuff. So we need to talk about it, and we need to do it. And everybody's got a different way, a different flair, a different style, a different way of, of being a witness in the community. But we should all be equipped in how to walk a new believer through these basic teachings. We should all here have, an, have a grasp and an understanding on the importance of the authority of the Word of God. Every single person here tonight should understand how to be assured that you're saved. Every single person here should know that God's redemption is more powerful than any sin we could ever commit. That's why we know we can be saved and held there in God's power. And every person here tonight should understand that in the life of a believer, in the life of a believer, there will be a struggle with sin, but it will not be victorious over our lives. We will struggle with sin, but it will not be victorious over our lives. We will be given the strength to raise our hand yet again and say, I need your power. God, I need your power. I need your strength. I don't want this because you're in me. I don't want this. And only because of your strength, he's promised us a way of escape. And we're going to talk about that next week. Anything else before we go on to next week's assignments? And what we'll do is this time is also if you're mentoring somebody, you're discipling somebody, and I've not hit the topic here in a couple weeks. If in two weeks, as we start winding down, if I've not hit the topic, and you say, well, none of the things you talked about is what I'm struggling with, with discipling, then talk to me, and we will I'll open up that forum, and we can throw some more subjects in here, because I'm, I'm, I've not covered everything. But I want to make sure that this church, Center Christian Church, is not just simply gathering here. I want to know that we're gathering here to go back out and share that gospel. That's what, that's what these sessions are about. All right, if you've got your handout, you turn it over. Who here does not have a handout? Okay, all right. Turn over to the back. You'll see next week's assignments. We talked about sin tonight, and we're going to discuss temptation in the life of a believer. This is specifically in the context of a Christian. What do you do with that? I've said once before, the goal of the enemy, of Satan, is to get the unbelievers thinking they're saved, and they're good to go, so that they never truly enter heaven's gates because they just thought they were saved. They just thought they were good enough. They just thought they went to church enough. But they never actually came to be saved by Jesus Christ. That's what Satan wants the unbeliever to think, is that they're saved. Satan also wants the believer to think that they're not saved and to wrestle with that back and forth. And do I have my salvation? I lost my salvation. I've got my salvation, but I might do something that could make me lose my salvation. Simple, basic tactic of the enemy to play on our ignorance. To get us locked into that fear. in that cycle, so we never boldly move out on our faith, and we don't ever demonstrate the genuine love that Jesus Christ created us to demonstrate because we are so focused on whether or not we're saved or not. And Jesus says, get your eyes on me. Get your eyes on me. You come to me for salvation. I will keep you safe, and I will continue to do the work that I promised I would do. When it comes to sin and temptation, we've got to look at it in that context. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 13. That's your assignment for next week. And if you have two or three sentences, just some thoughts that you got out of that passage. So you come uh, prepared as we hit this subject. And uh, it looks like Myla was the only one that came prepared tonight. She had everything written down in the book. And uh, nobody else, uh, everybody else, their dogs ate their paperwork. I'm just kidding. I'm messing with you. Hey, you guys dish it out. You guys better be ready to take some, okay? We do have a memory verse. 
I already shared it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There's no temptation taken you, except that is common to man. Quit muttering, Wayne. I don't know what you're muttering there, but it doesn't look good. No, you want to repeat it? You, you want to pray? He had no, <laughs> he had no memory. <laughs> this will be your memory verse, no, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And uh, I would like you to work on getting that memorized for our next session together as we talk about temptation. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Just read it. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. And uh, see what is said about temptation in Jesus Christ and, and what the connection is there and what that means for us living in the power of Christ and the power of his resurrection. Uh, uh, and uh, as far as next week's assignments, I think that's all I've got. Um, and I just lost the rest of the order of service. What did I do with that paper? It was, um, hmm. <laughs> I don't know what my hymn number is. I lost it. 308? How do you know that? Don't. <laughs> well, you guys are good. See, it takes a family. It takes a family. It takes accountability. Accountability. As we finish the service tonight, <laughs> huh? No, I'm, I'm checking right now, and I'm going to double check. Kent, I've got this under control. Yes, that is the one I picked out. Are we good on 308, Myla? All right. No, it's way too late for this situation. This one already tanked. We're, we're going to have a long talk. I can already tell you that right now. I am in trouble. I'm thinking of my escape plan tonight. That's what